Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Good evening. I um, have been really holding back a lot of emotion for the last few minutes. This is a dream come true for me. Thank you. Um, for those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Emiko Ono, the Director of the Performing Arts at the Hewlett Foundation. And welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Our performing arts team has an amazing program in store for you this evening. We're gonna have an amazing panel conversation by three amazing women. I'm gonna stop saying amazing, but that's just how I feel <laughs> right now. Um, we'll have a performance um, by, Hewlett, by Hewlett 50 Arts Commission's awardee, Faye Carroll. Uh, you have a treat in store for you there. And then we'll have a celebratory reception after, which, which I hope you can stay um, around for. But before, I'm, I'm feeling butterflies because you all are like my heroes. <laughs> and I can't believe I'm talking in front of you. Um, so before we get started, I just I wanna say a couple of things. I wanna say a few things about the Hewlett Foundation who made the Hewlett 50 Arts Commissions possible how the initiative came to be, and um, then I'll introduce the program. So I wanna go actually back to the Hewlett Foundation's first beginnings in 1966. Um, Bill Hewlett, who was the H in the HP of Hewlett Packard, and his wife, Flora, and also their oldest son, Walter, started the foundation. The legend that it was around the kitchen table, but we recently learned that it was actually in the living room. Um, and it was always his vision to have a professional foundation that was independent from HP, and we, we always have been independent from HP. But his vision was also that it would be a professional foundation that included some of the family, they would participate, but it wouldn't be a family foundation. And that's the Hewlett Foundation that we have now. It's really in his vision. And it's one of the world's largest foundations, and we're so grateful that it's in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the foundation now awards about $600 million every year. And for decades, it's worked in areas like the environment and education and gender equity. But from the very, very beginning, performing arts has always been part of its investments. Of the six grants that the group first made in 1966, two were to arts organizations. One was to the San Francisco Symphony, and the other was to KQED, which at the time had a lot of classical music programming. Isn't that fun? Um, so that enduring commitment is really what the background for the Hewlett Arts, uh, the Hewlett 50 Arts Commissions. You think by now I'd know how to say that. Um, but when this initiative was being formed, really to celebrate the foundation's 50th anniversary, the, there were three ideas behind the awards. And the first is that we wanted to provide artists with the resources that they needed to realize their bold visions. Not just their visions they have every day, but really like, what would it mean to step into that bold vision? The second thing we wanted to do was to provide organizations in the Bay Area who really deeply know the communities they serve to work with these artists, because that's a powerful combination, the artists and the organizations that are deeply rooted in communities. And third, we wanted these new artistic works to really speak to the concerns of Bay Area communities and to connect with audiences in the Bay Area, but also to have a life, hopefully, in other places around the world, um, around the country, as they lived on as artistic works. So I can't thank you enough for being here tonight to help us celebrate. 
Um, and especially to all the artists and the representatives of the organizations who are wearing those beautiful lays um, that received Arts Commission Awards, I wanna thank you for the art you have created, the art that you will create, um, and for all that you represent for this initiative. I mean, this really is um, profound work that you all are doing. So um, quickly, I'd like to uh, remind us that we are on um, past and present homelands of the Muwekma Ohlone. And I always like to do land acknowledgments because they're a reminder of the violence, the migration, and the settlement that has brought us here today and really was a subject of so many of the projects that you all created. Um, it's very much part of our history and our present day here in the Bay Area. Um, and tonight's event is called Resourcefulness and Resilience in the Arts. Um, because the last three years, I don't need to tell you, have been incredibly difficult. Um, but through it all, artists continued to create, and the Bay Area arts communities came together in a spirit of mutual aid. And they kept innovating even through all of the pain and all of the hardship that has happened and continues to happen. Um, They've continued to innovate, they've continued to adapt to meet the needs of the public, but also to feed people's souls when they really needed it most. And so that's the spirit we're here to celebrate tonight. Um, that so many of the carefully laid plans were really upended and you know they switched formats, virtual, new venues, people's work that was gonna be staged ended up being online um, and you know, being together at one point was truly a dangerous act, and people still found a way to create. They were still doing it. And so tonight we really wanted to celebrate everyone who's been through this process, been creating works through it all, that's all of you. And we wanted to really celebrate the resilience and the resourcefulness of you all. Um, so let me introduce our terrific panelists. First we have Zani Voss, she's a professor of arts management at Southern Methodist University, as well as the director of SMU Data Arts, a leading research center. We're also joined by Liz Lerman, who is, I think all of you know, a visionary artist, choreographer, writer, and educator, also a recipient of the Hewlett 50 Arts Commissions for her work, Wicked Bodies, that premiered at the Green Music Center in Sonoma last year. And moderating the discussion is Chloe Veltman, um, who is the West Coast correspondent for NPR's Culture Desk. So please join me in welcoming Zani, Liz, and Chloe to the stage. Thank you, Emma. That was beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Thanks to the Hewlett Foundation and the Commonwealth Club for making this possible. We're going to have a conversation about re-emergence, one of my very, very favorite topics. Um, I think about it a lot as a journalist, particularly over the last few years. But before we get going with our conversation, uh, the three of us wanted to find out who, a little bit more about who's in the room. Um, so if you're an artist, please raise your hand. Oh yeah, oh. a lot of artists, right on. And if you work in the creative industries one way or another for an arts organization or some, some other creative group or practice, who, who yes, yeah. oh, a lot of you too, yeah. brilliant, lovely to have you. Yeah. Um, anyone fit into the category of not really involved in any real pro professional capacity in arts and culture, but, but loves to go along, loves to be an audience member? Yes. yes. That's fantastic. Um, and then, and anyone else who just wandered in off the street and thought, oh, this looks interesting. <laughs> no, none of those people. All right, well. Um, so to begin with, we're going to head back to the dark days of the peak pandemic. Um, 
And I wanted to ask my two uh, illustrious colleagues here up on stage, um, what were some of the bright spots through that whole awful period that, that kept you going, that kept you feeling hopeful? Liz, you want to start? Well, thank you. Thanks. Uh, and Emiko, that was beautiful. I just want to say uh, also a thank you to Azel who made these for us. And that um, <laughs> I'm really honored to be sitting here, but any one of you could be here with so many stories to share as well. It's actually um, emotional too to just be in the midst of this and realize um, how we've all come together now in, the, in this particular moment. And, uh, as Emiko spoke of um, a land acknowledgement, I, I personally like to um, thank especially the basket weavers, the painters, the singers, the poets, the storytellers, the dancers, the ritual makers, who not only held the land but held their communities together, as I know all the artists in this room are trying to do too, as are all the people trying to support these cultures. and in that way, um, carry forward some of their best dreams. I, um, the, every time I make a work, usually there are certain ideas that get massaged and worked through, or I come in contact with things that just kind of shock me. Two pieces before Wicked Bodies, a project I was doing with physicists at CERN, they put me in contact with the uh, Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, which I, probably some of you in this room have heard about it, you studied, you might have learned the equation. This is a bastardization of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle I'm about to give you, but it speaks to me um, and has since I ran into it uh, as a way to kind of conceive some through lines in, in our work. It's something like this. If you measure the shape of something, you cannot feel or see or experience its velocity. But if you measure the velocity, if you move with the momentum, you cannot see the shape. It strikes me that this, uh, it's, first it's a really great choreographic thing, right? We're, dancers are trying all the time to figure out what's the shape. If I hold this long enough, you'll see it. But on the other hand, please let me just move and feel it and you know, go with it. But I've come to see this has a lot to do with change with institutions and with how we make things. So um, <clears throat> when I was on a tour in Edinburgh, I wandered into the museum and saw something, an exhibit called Wicked Bodies, 500 Years of Drawings of Witches. This was almost 10 years ago. I wasn't interested in witches before I went in, but when I came out, I was completely absorbed. <laughs> completely. I mean, it was pornographic, it was symbolic, it was wretched, it was, it was ridiculous. It was it kind of like the ideas that, um, you know, they're cannibals and, uh, eating children in the basement of the White House. It's like, it's kind of like that. And for that reason, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, mostly women, were murdered. Your mothers, your sisters, your daughters, your, your, and people who were just different. So. That was what I was trying to figure out. And I made many, many, many false turns. Some of those false turns had to do with the pandemic. But none of this could have been possible without the support of what Hewlett did. Because Hewlett, with the beautiful Jacob Yarrow and his team at Sonoma State, said, here is enough money to support somebody to go through all the ups and downs and ins and outs and impossibilities of trying to come to terms with that subject matter at this time in this country under the situation that we were in. Meanwhile, I had this beautiful, incredible opportunity to be at YBCA as a senior fellow. And so the, the conflation of these two things together, and some of those folks are here tonight to do also, um, really gave um, grounding to an artist that otherwise might have been groundless during the pandemic. <clears throat> Before, I just want to tell you just a couple of the false turns, because I think they, they relate to our stories that we need to hear. But I just want to say, before I do that, that it's not a huge amount of money. For my field, it's a huge amount of money. I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's really not that much money. 
but what it did to support so many artists over this period of time. So on my team, we're all part, you know, everybody has other jobs, everybody's working all over the country, we would come together to make this work. We had like um, Darren West, our sound designer, a Tony winner, so happy to have some work sustained during the pandemic because all the rest of his work was gone. So the witches got the best that ever was, <laughs> was, you know. So we were supported by, and here's where this shape thing comes in for a minute. There is no shape to this project. Most of us start with nothing, no shape. Enough of a something that 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 people could engage in. And then we were hunting for that shape, an early idea. Why is some knowledge criminalized? some knowledge erased, and some knowledge celebrated. And where did those witches get that knowledge from? First round of, of ideas, I thought, great, someone wants to collect the witches because they have some knowledge that this person wants. Problem with that is that the witches stayed victims. In that construct, the witches didn't have a voice. I didn't like that. So I said, we're not doing that, even though the collector was fantastic. It was really, he was really good. So um, the next idea, I was thinking, so I, I want to pursue this knowledge question with you for a little bit, because what happened is that I began to, th I, I was reading the book, The Sixth Extinction. The pandemic is now on. We're all in the midst of this thing, wondering what's going to happen. And I thought, oh, I know. The witches are wi witches because they survived previous extinctions. That's where they got, you thought it was a cockroach, actually, no, it was a witch. <laughs> she just shape-shifted a little bit. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> when, so, <sighs> I did a lot of work on extinction. And what I, I, this is my synthesis, I have to talk to a lot of the scientists at my school, Arizona State University. There is extreme innovation in times of extinction extreme innovation. Who survives? Well, if you want to survive extinction, you have to be a generalist. You can't be a bird with a long beak that can only drink water at a certain time of the day when the sun is just right in one plant. You can't, you won't make it. That's the shape problem. That bird has a singular shape and it cannot survive. It has got to figure out where the momentum is, how to shift that shape. Second thing you want to survive extinctions is you need to burrow. You need to get down underneath, which we did. And we did, all of us did. That was pretty profound, I thought. The third thing is you need to be able to move. That's the momentum piece. So <clears throat> I thought this was where we were going to go, but then I thought about it as we began to come out of the out of the pandemic and realized, I don't think anybody wants to come see a show where everybody's burrowing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we went to work with this question. What are the stories we're going to tell ourselves about this period as the nation is racked trying to understand how to tell the story of our past, how to tell the story of what was going on with the death of Mr. Floyd, how to tell the story of what we were going to face when we came out of this. And this is where the witches really showed their strength. So we decided that <clears throat> witches have a lot of jobs. Their jobs change. For example, witches are really good at doing medicine in back alleys, which they had to do again once Dobbs happened. <clears throat> right, so we were shape-shifting as we went. But the idea that witches actually select our narrators and that we were pressed to come to terms with the stories we want to be able to tell that we can live with together. And that's if, this is where the piece goes. And I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to tell you more about that when, when I come back. But um, yeah, that's enough for now. Whoa. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for that, Liz. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, Zanny, what about bright spots? Things that kept you going through through the peak plague. That's a tough act to follow. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, You know, I'll say that on a personal level, 
one of the things, and maybe you had a similar experience, it was the, the uniting and reuniting with family and friends where people were just very caring all of a sudden. You would get phone calls, people wanted to talk, they wanted to check in to see if you needed support or if you just needed a laugh. Uh, I think being a little bit less busy by not having to commute, by not doing some of the things you normally did, left more space for thinking of others and caring. Uh, and I thought that was a really uh, wonderful thing that I wanted to be able to hold after the pandemic um, had receded. From a, a, an industry, from an arts standpoint, I think one of the bright spots, uh, there are so many of them, just one is at the start of the pandemic, when things were really, uh, everyone was, there was a sense of panic and, and, and fear. Uh, we took a step back and said, let's think about what might the future look like a year from now? Mm. And worked with the National Endowment for the Arts and some of the national service organizations where everybody was being surveyed at that point about what are you doing, what's happening, what decisions are you making? And at the point, we estimated that, assuming that everyone would be able to open their doors again in October, which we know was mm -hmm. not a reality. We thought that's like the, the worst case scenario would be October. We estimated that a, a year out that arts and cultural organizations across the country would average a deficit about 26% of their annual budget. Mm -hmm. And so just start talking now as arts leaders, as board members about how are we going to, to deal with that. And then came these incredible relief initiatives from federal government, from state governments, from foundations. Um, you know, there was over $10 billion circulated to over 21,000 arts and cultural organizations, and a lot more if you consider more broadly the, the creative sectors, that really um, staved off a lot mm -hmm. of the closures that everybody was anticipating. Wow. So a bright spot, I think, you know, just to distill that is the sense that it, it, we are valued in society, you know, that arts and culture is not um, just a forgotten stepchild, that we do matter uh, and it, enough for governments and for our communities to want us to be around uh, through the most difficult times. And it, there are many other examples, but uh, you know, to me that was one of those early moments where you thought there's gonna be hope. Yeah, no, I fully agree. Um, but so, you know, we, we all know in this room that the pandemic pretty much upended everything to do with the arts and culture scene as, as we had known it before, you know, economics and audience behaviors and the type of work being done all completely changed. Um, now, Zani, when we spoke recently, you said, you called this a moment of rethinking, mm -hmm. not bad news, but different news, mm -hmm. which I thought was a really interesting way of, of thinking about this, uh, this massive paradigm shift. So I'm wondering if you could maybe uh, elaborate on, on that idea. Sure. You know, there's always change. Sometimes it's evolutionary, sometimes it's revolutionary. Um, and this was one of those moments where, you know, I think there's a, a bad thing of, of always looking around saying, well, you know, things are constantly changing, there's inflection points everywhere. This was really an inflection point. This was really a time where everything around us changed. Uh, and at the start of the pandemic, we were just finishing up a, a project um, that was about the alchemy of high performing arts organizations, working on it with Wallace Foundation, where we were interviewing 20 organizations that had done a big turnaround in their history versus 20 that were just always, it had been knocking it out of the ballpark in terms of their, their performance. And in understanding from these incredible arts leaders, what was some of the secret sauce to their success? One of the elements was adaptive capabilities that came up over and over again to your That's point. That's what Liz was saying, yeah, yeah, about change. Th this ability to know how to be nimble and amid uh, all of the different factors that people talked about and kind of the, the slow burn that success takes, all of a sudden adaptive capability was like downstage center in terms of its importance. Um, and when there's that much environmental dynamism, hostility, turbulence, uh, there were some incredibly successful organizations, organizations that seized that moment 
Um, and I'm happy to give a couple of examples of, of mm -hmm. them. But two things that we noticed, one was the really successful organization stopped and said, okay, here's our mission statement, here's why we exist. If we blew it up and said, given this mission statement, what are five other ways we could be working towards this mission statement? We don't have to just do things the way we've always done them. The who we are will remain the same. It's the how that will change. Uh, and they also reflected on um, that there was a, an organization called Community Wealth Ventures, and they always they, they were about trying to be able to generate more ancillary earned revenue. But at the foundation of it, they said, whenever you're trying to think of new ways to do things, always take inventory of what do you have, what do you do, what do you know? So what are those intellectual and physical assets, and how might they be redeployed? in different ways in order to get you to whatever that mission happens to be. Um, so a couple of really wonderful examples of that uh, deciding it, it's just different. Uh, one, there's an organization in Dallas called Dallas Black Dance Theater. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if any of you have ever, ever heard awesome. of DBDK. Awesome. They awesome. are fabulous. They're awesome. And Zanetta Drew, who is their executive leader, is one of the most no-nonsense, mm -hmm. kick your you-know-what uh, kind of leaders. And she, you know, in talking with her about what they did, first she said, instead of like running out for relief funding, the first thing we said is, the pandemic is not an arts crisis, it's a health crisis, it's a societal crisis. Mm -hmm. So they did not run to their individual donors of every size and said, we need money now. What they did was they turned to foundations, corporations, and donors over $25,000 and spent the first two weeks of the pandemic getting on the phone and calling up their patrons to say, how you doing? What can we do for you? How can we help? Are you, are you in crisis? Can we put you in touch with someone? They, they cared. They, they were neighbors to their neighborhood. And they decided we need to be sustainable. So every decision they made was about sustainability. They offered no programming free of charge in a virtual space. Everything had some price with it. They said, we're still a professional dance company. We're still going to charge. And in the first all virtual dance season, they wound up um, earning six figures in revenue that kept them sustainable. Mm. And they got so good at it that they innovated on their new capabilities in a virtual space to the point where they offer kind of conservatory like dance classes online for a fee. They have contracts with four school districts now for online programming. They have um, basically started the Netflix of the arts. It's on-demand DBDT programming that you can access anytime. And so th this is now, they're, they're back in person, but you know, they talk about the fact that when sporting events started being broadcast, it didn't diminish the demand for in-person attendance at sporting events. That you know, in arts and culture, how can th there's a change. How do we embrace that change? Um, you know, similarly, I'm, I'm sure those in the room know the Japanese American um, National Museum, the JNM in Los Angeles. Um, they had the pleasure of speaking with the executive director, Ann Burroughs, who said that when the pandemic first started, they said, we need to figure out how to be a virtual museum really fast. And they had 70 programs virtually in the first year. I'm sorry, 80 programs, 70% of which were done in collaboration. So this notion of developing collaborations has m meant now that they're doing everything. Uh, what did they, I had written down the name of it because I, I just like to discover Nikkei. It's a communications platform for people of Japanese ancestry worldwide with 750,000 people now signed up for it. It's extraordinary. Yeah, doing traveling exhibitions with pieces from the, the permanent collection when there's an increase in understanding around um, anti-Asian hate. You know, they're seizing this moment to expand. Um, and so you know, there are more examples, but I think those are glimmers of hope where people aren't saying, we're gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater, we're not gonna be who we were. But it's how can we continue to deliver mission? How can we continue to be relevant? How can we meet the needs of those whom we seek to serve rather than sitting back and just saying in this moment in time, how do our communities have to help us? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible to hear these stories. They're really important. Um, but I mean, I, I think we all know in our lives, in our personal lives, if not our organizational ones, about what it feels like to, to feel stuck. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I wonder, like Liz, if you could talk a little bit to the difference between the sense of sort of stasis and stuckness versus this idea of change and movement and embodiment of transformation. Well, um, I don't know if you remember after 9-11, one of the things that struck me, I think it was USA Today started running these poetry pages. And all there was just this outpouring mm -hmm. of poetry from people who don't consider themselves poets. And I think that the extremity of that fear, huh. either you have some choices. I can go to that fear place with my imagination or I can turn and do something with it. And I think this is one of the most you know, incredible gifts that we have and we so underuse it. Mm -hmm. Those of us who practice with it, you know, carry on. And it's not just artists. I, I often say Einstein was a choreographer because he did all those thought experiments. Like he, he stayed up in his imagination an awfully long time. But how do we help people find a way? Because sometimes people's imaginations, they, it just terrifies them. And, they just, and in fact, with all the discussion these days about trauma, we know that part of what that's about is that things come unbidden to you and you don't want it. So the possibility that you could use um, practice, because I think creativity, hope, I think all this stuff just needs practice. Mm. Um, you can practice. and. If people have access to that stuff, which a lot of this online stuff started to do yeah. for people, right, was to put them in direct relationship with things that they didn't, you know, didn't know that they could do. So, I, at least to me, it's har harnessing and harvesting the brilliant gifts that we've been given, yeah. and for us in our arts community, to do even more and more sharing of that stuff. Have you ever been stuck? Oh, sure. <laughs> we, I mean. I, I mean, I have been stuck in fear, but what I will say is um, maybe some of you know the critical response process, which is this thing I invented out of when I was so miserable about feedback in my profession. But um, if just an example of being stuck, I was actually, Jacob, it was during um, tech, because there we were checking, we didn't know what we had still. Um, and I was feeling I was doing such a bad job. So the stuckness was about my own doubt. So I went up on the stage and went up to each of the performers. And in critical response, the first step is you let people know what's meaningful about what they're doing, what catches your attention, what you find interesting or curious. And then you get into the more, you know, and it's not that positive, you know, that sandwich thing where you're nice and then you're mean and then you're nice again. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, 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 it's not that. You actually start with meaning. And I just took 15 minutes and I went up to each person and said, can you please tell me how I'm doing a good job right now? And of course, I learned a lot in those 15 minutes and got unstuck. My students are stuck right now, but this is their language. They say things like, I'm overthinking. Hmm. And I tell them, no, you're not overthinking, you're overjudging. Hmm. Thinking is good. Let's think, but let's figure out how to have judgment and suspend it. And my version of getting my own judgment out of my way is to go get help, which is such a beautiful thing in your story. Mm. This getting help and giving help, really. Yeah. Hmm. One thing we always think about uh, in terms of you know, recovery and improvement and getting on in the world is this idea that we have to get bigger and somehow, you know, the growth is good mentality and, and, and just having to keep growing and growing and growing and people coming out of this pandemic, I think oh, organizations are feeling even more pressure to have to grow. Um, but I mean, there's this whole other aspect to coming out of all of this, which is more to do with, you know, right sizing, I think. Um, and maybe not charging at this whole growth is good mentality. I'm wondering if, if both of you be uh, able to speak to that, that concept. Sure, I mean, so on the one hand, or, or arts and cultural organizations are, are back. And if you look like from 2018 through 2022, there, there was of course an incredible drop off and now things are rebounding. And if you looked in absolute dollars, the expenses are higher than they were even in 2018, but they're not keeping pace with inflation. And so it's actually 11% lower in terms of the amount that each dollar will help the organizations mm. to, to buy. And you know that's a struggle. 
Mm. And so uh, throughout the pandemic, with the whole um, racial justice movement, you know, this increased awareness of being a, a good neighbor, being relevant to the entirety of your local community, undoing some of the harm that you've done by saying you're accessible and then really not being accessible. You know, all of a sudden, and, and we heard this time and time again in in qualitative research and talking with folks of, you know, the, this DEI thing is so important, but when our doors open again, we're just going to really need to make some money. Mm. And so, you know, I think this notion of stopping to say, since the last recession until now, year on year growth has been constant within the arts and cultural field. Budgets get larger every year. But in the process of doing that, it's at what cost? Like, what has to support that? And usually it's increases in ticket prices. Mm. And so, you know, what's the balance that you're making in terms of welcoming income diversity into an audience? Into, into racial diversity, there are so many questions that have to be balanced in terms of that tension that I think it's actually a really good moment for that self-reflection for a field to say, is growth is good something that always works to the benefit of the ways that we serve our communities? And I, I know that um, you know, one of the wonderful things is that people are back. You know, mm -hmm. If you look at the average arts organization's budget, 5% more of budget now goes to paying people than it used to in, in 2018. And so you're talking about people in the organizations, not audiences, which are still down right. somewhat, right? Yeah, the audiences are, yeah, there's still about a 25% drop off in earned income. It's again, rebounded incredibly and you can't expect that to come back at the drop of the hat. It's right. going to be a, a, a rebuild um, and that'll take a little bit of time. But I, again, I think that's different. I don't think that's necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's simply how do you think about your place within, how do you show up in the world as an organization? And what, are, what is your sense of priorities? Mm -hmm. Liz, what are your... Well, uh, uh, as you're talking, it brings to mind several things. One, one we, we, we usually don't set our ticket prices, but there was a period in the time when I ran my company where we were self-producing in Washington, D.C., and we did a thing, we did a rebate thing. So we charged but then you could get um, one, two, or three dollars back at the end of the show, if, depending on how much you didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and did you pay more if you did like well, it? Well, this is what happened. I mean, you had, the rule was you had to give me some feedback about it. You couldn't just take the money. But, <laughs> I love this. But people also gave money. They emptied their pockets. We never lost money doing that. But the thing I always felt is, for whatever reason, when people are in the movies, although now prices are so high there too, you don't feel trapped when you're in a bad movie. But if you're in a dance concert and then you don't like it, you feel trapped. So, <laughs> yeah. so this was like a way just to sort of relieve that. But I've often wondered how that could be applied or how, how, how else that could be applied. But I think this question of scale is huge. I, I, I was recruited to teach at Arizona State, and if you don't know this, because you don't live in Phoenix and you don't see it on every bus, but we are number one in innovation for 10 years. And the, we, this school is insane. It just pushes nonstop and big, it's all about bigger. There's no idea like in the tour, you know, you change a person, one person at a time, you know, scale can be small. No, 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 no. Arizona State, it's all. So it's pretty personal for me in this way. Um, they measure knowledge systems at my school on how many research dollars you bring in. Mm -hmm. So where do you think we are? And they love that I'm there. You know, they have a banner up because I got a MacArthur a million years ago, so they have that up by the football stadium. <laughs> you go to the football stadium and see. But, but when I went to talk, <laughs> talk about what about knowledge systems, and now I want to talk about that again. I'm back on the knowledge and knowledge from the witches. But I often tell my students I don't sell my dances. I sell my knowledge. And that part of our t job, our task, is not only coming to terms, understand what it is that we've come to know through these incredible processes that we, that we are engaged in. And I know this feels burdensome to a lot of artists because it's enough that we do all that, but then you also have to help the world understand that you know it. And then you have to put it in some kind of shape that the world recognizes it and will then buy it, like a book or something like that. Although those don't make very much money, but. <laughs> But just, I, I, I think that um, 
we just have, we have so much knowledge. If we could figure this out and work through this scale issue, and certainly our, the younger generation is aware of the pressure around scale because they think about themselves and the planet every day, mm. every day. Yeah. And um, that, that is hard for them, really, really hard. Yeah. So if we're talking about right sizing or getting perhaps into a different headspace, there's also this idea and it's not a negative thing necessarily, but how do we contend with loss? Once we've decided certain things must be let go of, old ideas, old ways of doing things, it can be traumatizing, sad, all those things. I'd love to hear from both of you about that aspect of saying goodbye to things, which is so difficult sometimes to do. And freeing. And freeing too, that's why I say it's not a negative thing necessarily. Yeah. Um, you know, I think this has been such a wonderful time for r reflection. And I think it also speaks to this notion of there, there was a point in, in life where, in perhaps of other experiences, where you feel the pressure to say yes to everything. Every time you're asked to do something, you say yes to it. Mm. And I had a dean who finally said, I give you permission to say no sometimes. Mm. And, you know, the, this notion of um, it, it can't just be cumulative. You keep doing things, you keep doing things, it's additive. Something has to be let go if you're going to make space for change. And this has been a great time because you have really no choice but to change hmm. if you're going to be able to adapt to new environmental circumstances, new, new ways, you know, I, not from a personal standpoint, but from a, a an, an industry standpoint, you know, the, the changes in how people spend their consumption time, what they want to do, when they want to do it, what are they doing? Um, you, you, know, you can't go back to doing things the way you always do them. You have to be able to meet people where they're consuming. That means letting go of the way, the discomfort, because that, that is a, 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 it's easier to not change uh, it's easier to go back to the things that are comfortable, but it's not necessarily safer. It's not safer for sustainability. It becomes less safe as time goes on too, right? Right. So, you know, how do you find the courage to say, I'm going to actually make the safe choice by do, not doing the thing where I've always kind of held on to for safety? Mm -hmm. That's a really powerful statement. It, it may be easier, but not safer. Mm. I mean, even if that was a a filter that people used when they're thinking about these things, whether it's institutions or individuals. I think we may forget, or maybe there are people in the room who experience this, but in the early days of COVID, well, maybe halfway through, I remember that we were losing people and people couldn't go to funerals. Mm -hmm. And I, I am very close with somebody who was not able to attend her mother's funeral, and um, she is really suffering still mm -hmm. about this. So we, I think, um, and this is where uh, sort of the choreographer, the ritual makers, the, the meaning of why we come together starts to matter. I, I think people will come back to the theater and the dancing and stuff when it matters. And it, how, how we help it matter to them. And it maybe it's not that they come all the time, but once a year for some sacred festival or an opportunity to remember a mother that they lost and they never got to attend to. But I... I really feel we, um, I don't know, when you guys get, if you get new clothes, do you take something out of the closet? That's sort of my rule. I do, definitely. You know, bring something in, take something out, and I consider that practice for the harder things. Bring in a new idea, an idea has to go. Or up at the dance exchange, we had a thriving program called Dancers of the Third Age where we worked with older people and so we. We had to let that go when we moved in a different direction. And so we, and I just feel like if you take the time to honor it, have ceremony, make sure that people know their work mattered. Like for example, boards of directors, when institutions have to change and the board does yeah. not want to let it change. And part of that is all this work I put in, now what, it'll be gone, you know, it's not gone. And lastly, when I left the dance exchange, which I was, I founded it and then left after, 35 some years, anyway, they, they, they say they've composted me. And <laughs> I want to encourage everybody, it's really wonderful to be composted. Yeah. 
And in a way, it's like what you, it's, your, it's another filter. It's like, can we compost? What of this is you know, organic? What are we gonna live on? How are we gonna use this stuff? And you did that, or you were that. <laughs> it was your, your person. Because the, we, we have to let these things go. I get excited taking the recycling out. You know, just that sense of, it, it, it always feels uh, like, like you've made space for mm -hmm. the something else. Yeah, I agree. I feel exactly the same way about all that stuff. What do you think about it, Chloe? You're being so yes. good at asking us questions, but what do you think? <laughs> what do I think about composting, or what well, do I think about what? Any of this that you want to talk about. What do I think about any of this? Yeah. <laughs> you pick. Um, you pick. Um, goodness. Well, all right. I'm going to talk about um, some things that, that, that make me happy. I mean, I spend my life as a reporter. I have the, the great honor and the great privilege of listening to people's stories. I mean, there's nothing more um, edifying in, to me in, in the whole world. And I feel like the luckiest person alive to, to do that. And, and the, the trust that's involved, right? It, it cannot be understated what it takes someone to share, to share their experiences. And, and especially reporting on the arts, especially at a time when things have been really devastating for so many people, you know, to get to hear about how people are working, are finding their way through all of this has been really the thing that's kept me going, honestly. And uh, I've done lots of stories over the last three years um, to do with, with, with organizations. And I've been incredibly impressed by how some of them have found these new ways. They've been able to do this shape-shifting thing that you've been talking about so incredibly. I mean, things I've heard about like, uh, rehearsal cooperatives in New York City where small performing arts organizations that wouldn't otherwise, I mean, they, they're basically priced out. They can't rehearse. And now there's very nice space in the meatpacking district, which is, I think, free for BIPOC companies. Um, and they can use the space. For, I mean, but Pete, the pooling of resources is incredible. Or the story about the small performing arts company in Denver that basically took, took it on itself to um, get a big old school bus and do, it, do these, um, uh, these shows about um, in the environment, about um, climate change with community members who live in, in some of these very devastated communities uh, living in the shadow of power plants and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, there's that. But I think probably from this whole time, uh, the, one of the stories that sticks out in my mind the most and that carries me forward the most is uh, about this incredible nurse uh, here in the Bay Area. Uh, her name is Amine Mogadam, and she's Iranian-American. And I don't know, I can't really, honestly, it's lost to, the, to time how I met her, but she, for me, embodied the spirit of how you get through creatively through a pandemic, because all day long, she's, uh, you know, in the whole kind of hazmat suit doing COVID tests and helping, you know, people who are potentially very sick. Uh, and then she's suddenly decides she's going to pick up photography as a hobby. And she's out there taking all these incredible pictures. And then she's never really much of a cook. She suddenly decides, oh, now cooking is my thing and I'm gonna make these fabulous meals and I'm gonna bring cakes to people. Anyway, she had this whole creative life that kind of blossomed during the pandemic alongside the work she was doing as a, as a, as a frontline nurse. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing from her, that joy, that sense of resilience, her beauty, the way she moved through the world. And I carry that, I carry Amino with me, you know, uh, through all of this. And every time I, I think about getting through and re-emerging, I think about her. But anyway, enough from me. We've got three minutes left on the clock. <laughs> I wanna hear from both of you. Uh, so now at this time, how are you both finding resilience and hope at this time in your lives? Now that, you know, we're coming out of, I think, all of this. Hmm. Um, well, I'll, I will share that it, 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 it's not it's not over. It, it, I lost a sister in law to COVID just two months ago. It, it, but there, it's not over yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a, a sense every time that we would like to just put it behind us that it will affect our personal lives and our professional lives for many years to come. 
Um, what I what gives me most hope right now is I've tried really hard to adopt a daily practice of of gratitude, of thinking about uh, you know the, the the expression of how do you eat an elephant like one day at a time. You know, hope isn't something that's out there in the future. Hope is today, and trying to think of in every day what's going to be the best moment of today and keep that presence that there's there's joy in not letting it pass by because I think that that's uh, the, the moments of least hope is when you feel like you've just lost a week, you've just lost a month and you never stop to purposefully try to find the things that will give you peace. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Liz. Um, the, the show that I've done with Brett Cook, the visual artist, is still up at YBCA until June, yeah. June, middle of June, and I would love it if you could go see it. But it's fabulous. Because Do check it out. Part of what that show and being at YBCA with Brett has done is reminded me of the power of relation and relation over time. I mean, he and I were supposed to be there for a year. It's three years, and this is where the pandemic was wonderful because we they just kept extending and we got to stay in relation. And when I think through to the longevity of having time, like I encourage all of my, you know, the young people that I see, you know, get laboratories. I was five years in residence at Children's Hospital, 10 years at the Roosevelt Hotel, 20 years at my synagogue, three, you know, long periods of time to test and test and test and test. So that Jacob and I also in relation for so long could withstand the ups and downs of all of that that we went through. So, you know, all of that feels just really important to just take the time. And uh, the other thing is, um, speaking of time, is I'm old, and I had a big birthday, and uh, I find myself in, a, in, in, in this new habitat, and I really love it. Mm -hmm. It's like this plateau, and it, there's no horizon. I mean, there is one, but, <laughs> you know, but I, don't, I don't know where it is. And so it's risky, and risk is a wonderful thing. In fact, risk and hope go together. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're tied together. And up, you know, there are the little green shoots around my students, and there's these old tumbleweeds, and there are other people up there in our age wandering around. It's very breezy and very beautiful. And um, I find that hopeful, like just to be up there and you know, see what happens. Well, thanks, and here's to New Horizons. And thank you both for the lovely, edifying discussion. And thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being thank part you. of it. Thank you. And that's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.